A couple of years ago, you were a head boy. Now you're on the Dyson Engineering Program, one of the most competitive courses in the country. So it's definitely a tough course to be on. Yeah, I like maths, I like physics, I like learning things. Yeah, I loved building things and putting things together and hoping it worked and it ever did. But that's what engineering is, that's the fun bit. I think the teacher used the sample sentence, you have to be really good at maths and physics to become an aeronautical engineer. And so, sounds all right. And from then on, I was just going to do engineering. Fabian, thank you for coming to Cambridge today. It's lovely to be having a conversation with you. A couple of years ago, you were a head boy. Now you're on the Dyson Engineering Programme, one of the most competitive courses in the country, and having turned down a place at Cambridge, to take up that place. Now on the Dyson website, it describes the course as not being for the faint hearted. How true has that been for you? I think that's certainly true. Um, I mean, it's an action packed thing uh, where you're chopping and changing what you're doing day to day and you're constantly busy or working on both academic side of things as well as on real workplace projects. And there's always stress, there's always pressure, there's always deadlines, but once you work hard through those, that's where the rewards come from, that's where the learning comes from. So it's definitely a tough course to be on and a tough decision to make to get there. But once you make that choice, you do get the rewards and you kind of see where it's coming from. Tell me about a typical day. Is there such a thing? A typical day is a stretch. Um, but so an academic day, uh, it kind of, they split into two. You've got your academic days, your workplace days. Your academic days as a morning of lectures where you'll have uh, four hours or so uh, covering two modules. Uh, that's twice a week and then in the afternoons you'll have a lab session where you'll be running experimental stuff towards coursework or doing uh, problem sets or mocks or just general self-study uh, for the afternoon but that every so often gets thrown in with a work meeting which you just get booked into in the afternoon as well um, and then a workplace day you get in nice and early um, have a coffee because it's necessary um, and then yeah, sit in meetings and then you're working, you chat to your line manager, uh, your mentor, and make sure that what you're doing towards your project, you kind of get one project over the six, uh, first two years, you do six month rotations, and over your six month rotation, you have one main project. You kind of make sure you're aiming towards that project, you know where you're going with that, but it's a lot of self-control and a lot of self-management, time management in that. And then you might give a presentation to your team or the wider team, so it can be uh, cross-continental, so giving a lot of presentations to teams in Singapore. And yeah, you tend to be spending a lot of time just booked up and then working. It sounds very much like, I say, proper work, but you know, compared yeah. to the student life, which is often maybe turning up for a few lectures and having a few deadlines and then maybe an exam week, you really chose the path like to be thrown into the world's work. It sounds like nine to five meetings and presentations and responsibility, which I guess lots of your friends that left school at a similar time probably don't have as yet. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that comes up is like, especially comparing it to other students, but also to other workplace, like other m members of the team, you're doing a 40 hour work week, plus doing the extra studying you have to do as a student on a tough course. So obviously I know plenty of friends who've gone to normal universities doing their degrees. They have, as you say, a few hours of lectures and they do self study, they do work, but they also get a lot longer holidays and a lot longer. Uh, but that comes with the same side of things as the practical experience, the industry experience, which you're getting from working in a real team. But those are people who, you know, they work their nine to five and then can pretty much switch off after that. And then we go home and I've got coursework deadlines the next day. So it's a lot of pressure. It's a lot of pressure, but I think it's a, there's a level of realism that comes into that. The pressure is mainly on yourself, like from yourself. Um, so if you choose to push for a first with distinction and everything and, uh, you know, make your work targets and blow the project out of the water, and you can do that it will just take up your entire life. But if that's where you want to put your focus, you can, but there's a lot of people who take the more practical approach, as I do, um, where you aim for not necessarily first of distinctions, you're going solid grades, you know, two, one, um, and then also doing your workplace thing, but enjoying it and making sure actually, just doing four years of a constantly working thing, you have to be able to enjoy what you're doing. Sounds like you've got quite a healthy balance. Yeah, um, no, I put a lot of effort into that. Um, try and maintain hobbies outside. Um, I make sure I see friends, socialise. Uh, I live in Bristol, it's a great city with a lot of life outside of work. Um, so I can go home and just enjoy doing things which have nothing to do with 
anything to do with my degree. I'd like to ask you a little bit about home life as you were growing up as a child and perhaps where that passion for engineering came from. I mean, I know my kids like to play with Lego, they like to build things, they like to be creative. Were you that kind of child as well? I think building is a, is a stretch, it's overselling what I did. I, I was always found with a roll of sellotape and scissors uh, as the main thing. Uh, I mean, my granddad was an engineer um, for, he did power station stuff, so I kind of grew up with that around me. And then um, both, both my parents kind of just encouraged the learning side of things. My mum is a teacher and so was always there to you know, edu help with the academics having an importance. Yeah, I loved building things and putting things together and hoping it worked and never did. But that's what engineering is. That's the fun bit. Um, just, yeah, so it's tape, scissors. And then I remember I first decided to be an engineer in a year six spelling test um, when the word aeronautical came up. And I think the teacher used the sample sentence, you have to be really good at maths and physics to become an aeronautical engineer. And I just went, sounds all right. And from then on, I was just going to do engineering. Uh, followed that through secondary school at Perth and yeah, went on with it. No regrets yet then? No, not yet. Um, when you look back on your childhood then and sort of what shaped you into becoming the person you are, um, well, I always see as you as a very wise person, like even when you're at the Perth, you always seem to be very responsible above your years. What do you think that's due to? I mean, I think there's a lot of in that where independence and man, just a lot of freedom at home. I think it was always a case of just what I wanted to do, I, I did. And if it went wrong, my parents were very supportive people. Outside, I was always sociable and liked meeting people. I still do, love meeting lots of people. And when you do that, you kind of have to take some onus of demonstrating yourself and being aware of the other person so you can engage in a conversation in a real way. You did some acting as well, didn't you? I remember at the first. Tell me a bit about the other hobbies and the other parts of your character. I did drama for a few years towards the end. Uh, I've also played rugby since I was six, which had a big effect and kind of, it seems like they'd counteract each other completely, but I found that I loved putting them together because you're kind of showing two different sides, uh, but also finding the parts where you can be creative in rugby and just put it together and work hard in acting. It's that interpersonal skills. So rugby, obviously, massively social sport. I still play that to this day, say three times a week. Um, and that has a mass, a great social impact. Um, Whereas drama, obviously, using similar skills, still speaking, public speaking, and being able to convey your emotions and what you have to say. And kind of bringing those two together, you can put that into normal life and really see that, you know, how to put yourself out where you want to be, show what person you want to be. And what ways have you drawn on all, all those skills and experiences from school now that you're on the Dyson course? I'm always the first to step forward and give a presentation, like make a PowerPoint, put it together. When you're doing a group coursework, it'll often end in a presentation. And I will say, no, I'll take the lead on this. We'll split, it. you divvy up the tasks and you make sure you take, I take the lead on the presentation, make sure it's all running smoothly. So that's kind of there together with the teamwork where you're looking at how you're splitting your tasks and being willing just to make that hard decision because sometimes you have to. Um, but then also being able to stand in front of people confidently and give the impression you want to give and edu educate or impart what you've learned from your project. So you do your six month project, you then have to do a presentation at the end of that where you're trying to sum up six months of work in 15 minutes. There's a lot of pressure on that and a lot of people can feel nervous, but it's kind of knowing how to steady yourself, knowing that you've done it before. And that worst thing that happens is you give a bad presentation. Engineering is a very popular vocation. What would you say to young people, perhaps they're at school, they're interested in that kind of career, what advice would you give them if they're looking up to you and thinking, that's what I want to do? I'd say practical stuff, find what you enjoy about it. Um, so for me, it was always doing the practical and yeah, I like maths, I like physics, I like learning things. But a lot of people, that isn't what suits them. You kind of think, you have to do your maths, your physics, and then go to a university, do another three, four years of theoretical study. Then you join a graduate scheme where you're doing two years of first doing practical things. Whereas if from an early, during school years, you can work on mini projects at home, just by ridicule about, from your sister about things going horribly wrong. If you can work on those projects from an early age and kind of get used to a timeline, planning it out, uh, sourcing materials, then working with them, putting them together, working out why it goes wrong, and then putting those lessons into future ones and then seeking opportunities to keep that up. So I, I love the fact that I now do a practical degree. Everything is, it's four years where I'm working three fifths of that time in a workplace team doing practical study. 
and that's what makes me still enjoy engineering whereas I know a lot of people find it very stressful at universities doing your lectures and end after end doing writing report on reports and it's all theoretical whereas you get to put it together. You talk about your sister there making fun of you and when your projects were weren't going right as a child. What were some of those projects? Bear in mind I was seven at the time. Um, I tried to build a bench out of a chair. It was, I don't really understand my motivation behind the project to this day. And it was awful. It was atrocious. I had legs that were completely different lengths, were barely fixed together, and it had to be rested against a wall to just about stand up. Um, and yeah, our parents hesitantly perched on it for about 20 seconds and then got up as it collapsed. But it's one of the things you learn from. And then you go to look to towards year 11 sit form, uh, decided to try and build a model plane out of um, like a dowel in a structure, chicken wire around the outside, and then kind of uh, newspaper as a canvas type of material to give it more air. And the designs look far better, and it seems more thought out, and it worked just as well. It's the process that you get towards that end goal, the fact that it looks more thought out, the fact that I read around the project, uh, the fact that I sourced the materials myself rather than just hacking apart old things we had in the garage. Like you can see the evolution there, and then now I'm doing things where I, I make actual working things. Sounds like you had a really busy childhood and teenage years, building things, making things, using a lot of your um, ingenuity, I imagine, to try and you know, create new things. Um, you mentioned earlier about your granddad influencing you because he was an engineer and your mum is a teacher. Um, so how has that helped you become the person you are now? So I think a lot of it's just, it's always a method of conversation. It's always a topic where you can have an interesting discussion. It's like we both clearly just had that common interest. And so I'd go to my grandparents' house and just sat around the dinner table. One of you seen a news story and you had to chat about the engineering behind it and how that had impacted the field. And also with different generations with vastly different perspectives on things. He's come from working on coal power stations and more obviously fossil fuels and turbines and that. Whereas I'm looking at more Everything to me is renewable engineering. It's all about slimming down costs and material use and energy use and then making it as renewable as possible. So it's kind of those competing impact interests, but both with an interest in the other's point of view. And it's, it creates a good conversation it, and it just inspires you to think more about it, read more about it and kind of drove me towards more. I could actually study this. I could put this further and I could, you know, not just enjoy making things in the garage, which he's always done. He's got a massive, nice workshop in his back garden, which as a kid, you know, you go in, you're about six, six years old, trying to look and see all the power tools and have no idea what to do and just told to stand back because I would manage to cut a finger off. <laughs> it's a good uh, job you didn't. Yeah. So yeah, kind of being around that and going, well, I want to do that when I grow up. And then I remember he helped with, I had a year eight homework in, um, where we had to build a castle in history. And he helped massively with that, making that, the physical work in, on that. And that was one of the first projects we'd kind of done together where we, done at least a similar a similar order of magnitude of work on it obviously he did far more I was 13 but yeah just familiarity with the subject and then seeing that it can be a great career path and he's a he's a great bloke. So what really stands out for me and what you're saying is that you kind of really brought engineering to life throughout your childhood it wasn't just your head in books learning the theory but it was very much about experimenting and trying and being creative where do you think that creative side of Fabian came from? I think it's that I hate reading books. No, um, <laughs> no, I think, so going back to family again, it's like my whole family has done drama. So my granddad did drama, my mum did drama at uni, my sister's done drama at uni. And it's kind of always just been around that you do, you can do the acting and you put on, the, you put on shows as children. And uh, then came to school, my sister did first players from year seven up to year 13. I joined later on and did stuff. That creativity with that side of things, enjoying the fact that you can be loose with stuff, but then putting that into objects. And I've always had a great interest in architecture as well, where you've, it's artistic, but creating a physical thing, which has a practical purpose, but looks awesome. And it's kind of, that comes from the creative stuff as a child. You're quite a role model for young people who may think about that career in engineering and also the path that you've chosen to take. And what would you say to somebody listening or watching our podcast who really wants to follow in your footsteps? What's some good advice you can pass on? Follow what you enjoy um, and follow what opens up opportunities for you. So I always 
I chose the A-levels I did because I wanted to open up opportunities in those subjects I enjoyed. I knew that when I got to the end of my A-levels, I could pick, or when it came to time to choose my degrees, I could pick from so many because my A-levels uh, tended to that. What were they? Uh, math, further maths, physics and chemistry. And then I did an EPQ as well, but that was just fun. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, I kind of went from there. I went university choices. I chose a wide range um, and then also found Dyson. And the decision just came down to, I enjoy doing practical things. I don't really want to sit in lectures my whole life. And I, I want to open up opportunities. If I get to four years time, at the way, the path I've chosen, I'll have a degree, four years industry experience. I'll be close to chartership, but also, you know, no student debt because of the practicalities of the program. Whereas if I'd gone to university, four years experience, I would have been chartered engineer. So you're looking at different employee um, rewards that way. But I'd be in student debt, I would have sat in, in a classroom for four years. I'd be looking for a graduate scheme. And I just, I liked where I saw myself after the Dyson programme rather than university. The world is your oyster, I imagine. Yeah, very You're much working so. on projects that are probably top secret, but that we might be using in our homes in the not too distant future. Yeah, exactly. Looking at the next four, five, ten years, kind of looking at the project plans and working through them, which means that you see, but it's lovely to see the technology at early stages. Like obviously Dyson are known for creating new technologies and working on them, new research, and being able to be part of the early stage stuff, not just tuning the fine details at the end, but fully involving things. It's great to see. We're ending our podcast with um, all our guests passing on some wisdom from their life or some famous quote or just something that they kind of would say, this is some advice from me to you. What, what do you live by? Do you have a motto or, or some thoughts that you can pass on to future generations? I mean, I'm racking through my head and I'm going to have to go with the fridge is just a broken freezer. There we go. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank uh, you. I'd love to come back. Yeah. Thank you.